Hey everybody, it's Daniel. Welcome to my house. And we are here to do your Q&A answers as promised. We've done it very quickly this time, so I'm very proud of the team. Yeah, so we had just over 1,600 questions come in. So we narrowed it down to about uh, 10 to 15. We're gonna try to get through. It may take a minute, so bear with us. And uh, let's go. Okay, so the first question, and you guys, I may pronounce your names wrong, and I apologize. Uh, Again, um, I'm going to give it my best shot. So this is from uh, Saba Natizan, uh, S-A-B-E-N-A-T-I-Z-O-N. And they say, or they ask, uh, I just want to ask if um, you are adjusting that now that Mango is not with you and how did you cope? Um, it was the toughest day of my life. Um, the day that uh, we had to say goodbye to Mango, it was um, very, very tough. And I had to travel uh, not long after that, so that made it somewhat tougher I think um, although it was good to, to work and to, to stay busy it's been really hard um, she's here in the house we have her here she's always with us um, we're always talking about her we have so many memories so many pictures so many videos that I will hopefully eventually kind of put together and, and you guys can see them but um, she is in my heart and I believe that she's She's watching over me and, and my friends and our family, and uh, she was so special that um, I know that that her presence is going to be uh, omnipresent. So uh, Matt's recording right now. Say what's up, Matt. Hey, what up? Uh, we always talk about her. She was our little girl, and um, yeah, we had some 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 sad, rough moments. We had uh, some really happy moments. Uh, the day that she passed away, we we celebrated her life, and we had a, a great evening, and we toasted to our amazing little girl, Mango. Okay, the next question comes from Lara Vanessa, and she asks, uh, "How did you, Matt, and Martin meet?" Okay, so I get this question a lot. A lot of you know that Martin and I met in 2004. I was, uh, I was a model then, and he was a, an agent at a modeling agency in Seoul, Korea, and he booked me on a job. So I flew from New York City uh, to do a, uh, I think it was a car commercial in the, uh, in the Mojave Desert. It was nice and hot. So I met Martin out there, and we, uh, we had to do this crazy commercial where I was like running through the desert over and over. I almost got heat stroke. And this guy was just like the coolest guy and he was so present with me and, and just uh, his energy was fantastic and I thought, man, I got to stay in touch with this guy, you know, we could probably do some cool stuff in the future together and that blossomed into an amazing relationship. And so here we are, geez, uh, 14 years later and uh, we have our own company together in Korea. We've. Uh, We've done so much, we've traveled the world together, and he is uh, one of my best friends in the world, and uh, he, he's a brother to me. So that's Martin. As far as Matt goes, Matt and I have been best friends since uh, we were 16 years old. Yeah, so, geez, I don't wanna date myself, but 22 years or something like that, right? My math off. I went to high school in Michigan, Carson City, and Matt went to high school at the same, at the same high school. He was from a smaller town, so, he, uh, he came in just at, in ninth grade, I think. And we didn't get along at first because he was really good at basketball and so was I. So we had competition. And slowly we began to, you know, grow on each other, get to know each other and hang out together. And we had so much in common. And so we just, uh, we just got along. And throughout the last 15 to 22 years, we've, you know, we've been apart together, our paths have crossed, and we always kind of wanted to work together. And finally, when I started doing Criminal Minds and I knew I was going to be here in the States more, um, I thought it'd be a good opportunity for us. So now we, we work together and it's uh, it's been great. So that is uh, Martin and Matt. Matt, jump and say hi real quick, just so they know you're here. This is Matty. <laughs> so yeah, that's the story. Uh, the next question is from Simple Wisdom, the channel. That's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting ID. And they ask, who were your 
male role models, mentors that taught you how to be a man, what lessons did they teach you? Um, I have a couple, but I mean, to be honest with you, it's, it's just my dad, my father, Phil. Um, he taught me so much growing up. He was an amazing father. He still is. First and foremost, he taught me how to stay sort of even keel, never get too high up, never get too far down. Uh, taught me how to be humble. He taught me how to um, live a simple life. And he also taught me a lot of trades in life, like, you know, um, a little bit of carpentry, working on cars, uh, how to build stuff. He was a fantastic father. Um, never really raises his voice. Um, you always knew if you were in trouble with dad because he would get really quiet and walk away. And uh, I don't know, he did something fantastically right. He's, he's a great dad and I've always looked up to him uh, at the same time being his son. And to this day, I respect him so much. And he's still, um, he's still number one. In terms of other male role models, um, when I first started modeling, there was a guy that came into my life, his name was Sebastian, and he was my first modeling agent. And I was from a very small town, and he was in Chicago. And he was kind of my conduit to um, walking into a bigger city, into a bigger world. And when you're from a small town in Michigan, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into in a big city, uh, trying to navigate the world. And, and Sebastian was incredibly helpful, incredibly kind. He became a wonderful, wonderful friend. Uh, someone that I could um, count on, sort of a lighthouse in a crazy, crazy world. Um, he since then passed away and I miss him very much. And uh, I think about him often. But uh, yeah, those two uh, men were incredibly, uh, profoundly uh, impactful in my life. Next question is from gk.ksh. And they ask, what is the must-have app on your phone? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, for me, it's, I'm such a, such a nerd sometimes. I'm obsessed with real estate and homes. So um, I don't know if I'm plugging the app, but I love this Trulia app because I get to see all the prices of the homes around me and you can look at any house and, and check like how long it's been listed, how much it's worth, uh, what the mortgage would cost. You can check all the markets, even when you're overseas it works or when you travel any new city, I like to check out and see like, I was just in New York and uh, you know, I was interested in seeing what a two bedroom in the West Village is going for. So I can just go on Trulia Check it out, that's a huge hobby of mine. I also love Auto Trader because I, I love cars, so I'm always like pricing cars. I'm boring. So I'll just be hanging out, checking car prices of, of cars that I'll never buy because it's some weird hobby of mine, but uh, I don't know, I like it. Morgan.xoxo space love. They ask, hey Daniel, do you enjoy working with Matthew? I think Matthew Gray Goobler is who they're talking about. And is he fun to be around on Criminal Minds? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Matthew, Matthew is an absolute blast to be around. Uh, I'm sure you're probably a fan of his and uh, he is so full of life. He's such a cool guy, he's so incredibly intelligent and uh, the set brightens up when he comes around. So he's, uh, he's, he's fantastic. It's funny because a lot of people don't know that Matthew and I have known each other since 2004. Uh, we used to model together back in New York City. So we were young kids and uh, we had long silly hair and uh, we'd go to all these casting together, castings together, we'd take our books with us. And I remember the first time I, uh, I ran across Matthew and I was, um, I was in New York and I had a casting, I think it was Target or something. It was a commercial cast, TV commercial. And I was super nervous because I wasn't, I hadn't started really acting much. And I got to the casting, this big building, and I turned the corner and there was this loud, skinny, long haired guy who was like holding court with like 10 people. And he was telling the story and he was like animated and, and dropping jokes and he was just super funny. And I, I stood there and I looked at him like, who is this guy? You know? And then I thought to, I thought to myself, well, whoever it is, he's going to be okay. Cause he's definitely got a head on his shoulders and he's entertaining as hell. 
and it was, uh, it was Goobler, and that was one of the first times I'd met him. The next question is from Sophie Wan Kanobe, C-A-N-O-B-E. Uh, I probably butchered that. Anyway, they, they're saying, Daniel, I've, I have a son that is half Chinese, half Caucasian. Any advice as he grows up on how to identify himself? Um, that's a really, really good question. I don't have any children yet, so I, have, I don't have experience with the kids, but I can just speak from my personal experience. Um, it was interesting for me because when I was growing up in a small town, uh, it was predominantly Caucasian. Uh, I would say probably 95% Caucasian. And uh, I probably didn't even meet another Asian person until I was in my, my teens. So I definitely gravitated toward my, my Caucasian side. and. I think that was good at the time because you know, it was good that my parents just let me be myself, find my way. There were, there were a lot of different types of groups that I could have went toward, but I found the right group for me in terms of friends. And I'm sure your son will too. Um, but it was just about my folks letting me be myself, make my own mistakes. And uh, it worked for me. And then interestingly enough, once I got older, I ended up spending a lot more time with my Asian side. Um, after 18, I was modeling and then I went to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, um, and eventually ended up living in South Korea. And so a lot of my adult life has been um, my Asian side, very much, especially my Korean side. And it really has helped me to feel, um, uh, to come full circle. And I think I needed that and maybe your, your child will too eventually. So I guess my advice would be just be there to support them trust that they will find it on their own and it's there's something interesting about it because i think it's weird how i just kind of ended up finding my asian side i think that will happen eventually though there's something inside of you that needs to get in touch with with who you are innately and i think they'll find that so when they're younger if they're gravitating towards one side or another it's not a big deal they'll, they'll figure it out but i think it's just about supporting them you know not judging um making sure they're socially active, getting out doing things. I'm a big fan of sports, not everyone is, but I think just being involved in groups, whether it's whether it's sports or, or theater or whatever it may be, just, just as long as they're active, uh, they'll figure it out. All right, the next question is from uh, Janelle and Jude, and they're asking, have you been using that manpower you received in I Live Alone from Pangnade. So if you guys don't know what this is, I did a, a show called, uh, in Korean it's called Naonja Sanda. It's called I Live Alone. It was a reality show that took place in my house here and they followed me around my house for a weekend and the hosts uh, came over from Korea and they gave me gifts and one of the hosts gave me this uh, Korean uh, liquor that's supposed to help boost male stamina. So to answer your question, here it is, and uh, not yet have we cracked her up. We're waiting for a special day, so maybe after we wrap season 14, I'll, uh, I'll dig into this and have myself a night with it. But I gotta be honest, uh, kinda scares me a little bit. Okay, the next question is from J-U-Z-L-O-L-A. Juz Lola? Uh, they're asking, you went in for multiple auditions in your life, uh, acting auditions, and you've gotten rejected. So, yeah, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Just kidding. How do you cope with it? Well, a lot of it's experience. Um, when I was younger, it was tough to cope. When I was in my 20s, you just, you held on so tight. You know, you go in and you'd, you'd do a good job, you thought, and you wondered why didn't I get the part. And I was, as I've gotten older, you realize that you really have no power uh, in what happens after you leave that room. And I know now from being behind the scenes of it all, I've cast, I've been a part of casting uh, on Beyond Borders, I've been a part of production side, that sometimes it just boils down to you not being right for the part aesthetically. Um, a lot of it has to do with who they're casting next to you. Um, sometimes it has to do with age. So there are a lot of factors that you can't control. All you can do is go into that room and be prepared and ready and, and kill it. You know, do your best, be, be off book, make sure you know your lines and be confident and don't rush. 
and do your best. And sometimes you're going to stumble. And as I got older, I started to get the confidence to even stop in the middle of an audition and say, can I just start again? And you got to feel the room. I mean, if people are moving fast and you don't think that's a good idea, then don't do that. But sometimes you can if you mess up, you know, but at the end of the day, um, after you leave that room, your job is done and you have to let go of it and move on. You know, there's no reason in taking that baggage with you, you know, where you, I mean, I know it's tough. Sometimes it's big movies, sometimes it's your first job, but it's just that, a job. And once you start treating it that way, it'll be much easier. All right, next question is from, oh, Heart of the Witch, Heart of the Witch's Path. I have so many questions about this. They're answering, they're saying, I'm a new fan. Uh, do you enjoy or have time for reading? Uh, if so, who's your favorite author? And by the way, I'm from Lansing. Awesome. Uh, Lansing is like 40 minutes from my hometown. Had one of my first jobs in Lansing, in Frandor, at the USA Fitness uh, Fitness Center. And I was, uh, I was a porter in the locker room, which means I was the guy mopping the men's locker room. Yeah. Yeah. I do have time to read, especially when I'm on flights. Uh, that's generally when I'll do my reading because I really just have to read scripts here for Criminal Minds because they come in so fast. Um, we really have to stay on top of things. But my favorite author is Haruki Murakami. He's a Japanese author. He writes fiction. And uh, I'm obsessed with his writing. It's, um, it takes you places. You know what I mean? It's, it's very cinematic. And you fall into the stories. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, for me, it's an escape. So, I mean, the first, his first book that I read was Kafka, Kafka on the Shore. And then I read, uh, I think it was the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And yeah, I've just, I've read all his books and they're fantastic. So I recommend reading Haruki Murakami. Okay, the next question is from, is, is it Janya McKenzie? I see you all the time on the comment section. I know, I know you're a, a great fan and, and we, we love you very much. So I hope I didn't pronounce your name wrong, but uh, thank you so much for being such a great fan. Um, and you're asking, uh, what are your thoughts on holding a win a date with Daniel Henney contest where the winner would come visit you for a weekend and the winner has to plan in advance one full day of activities, including at least one act of charity. Wow, I really thought through this. And for the two of you to do during that time. Much love, blessings always. Oh, my name is pronounced Tanya, but, but spelled Janya. So, Janya McKenzie. Great. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. I've, we've been trying as a team now that we, we're getting uh, you know, settled here in Los Angeles and trying to, to work with the social media more to, to do these kind of type of things. So uh, I would totally be open to that. Uh, probably after Criminal Minds has finished this season. Um, but yeah, like have someone come out, do a little contest, um, have dinner, maybe see a movie. And then uh, yeah, charity thing could be cool. I'd like it to have to do with dogs, maybe like doggy adoption. You can have Roscoe come out and be an advocate, have him hold the sign. Um, yeah, that's a great idea, Janya. I, uh, I'll think about that. Okay, my next question is from Dee, and I always have to do one from Dee because she's amazing, and uh, she's been a fan for like 300 years. And, and I can't, I, I'm just blown away by how cool you are. So let's answer your question. If you had a chance to go back in time, whether to relive the moment or to change the moment, what moment would that be and why? Huh. Relive the moment or change. There's not a lot that I would change. I think I've been really lucky. I've had some great moments. Um, jeez. You know, I think I would go back to probably the biggest acting moment for me was when uh, I was cast in X-Men. And I was here in Los Angeles and I was meeting people and it's even hard to remember exactly how things transpired, but uh, I got a phone call from Fox and they wanted to see me about X-Men. And then the part was offered to me of Agent Zero. It all happened very fast. And I think that either um, Hugh Jackman or, or John Palermo, his producing partner, had seen some of a, a movie that I'd done, my father, and they, they were interested. And so they said, well, we're offering you the part of Agent Zero. 
um, go home and look over the contract, listen to some music, and come back and tell us yes. <laughs> okay. And I was like 28 years old and I had just come to Los Angeles. And so I was just so blown away by how fast everything was happening. And so of course we said yes, as the story goes. And then literally must've been a week later, I was in New Zealand um, shooting my death scene with Hugh Jackman. And I was just completely just mind blown. Right, I had Hugh Jackman in full leather Wolverine claws walking toward me. I'm dying in a helicopter that's blowing up. I got the action director of Rambo directing us, helicopters flying over. I'm getting bit by New Zealand like bugs, flies, and it was just so crazy, you know. And then we uh, we were there for like two or three weeks, and it just flew by. So I would definitely relive that, relive it, and just kind of take it all in and go slower uh, in life you don't realize how fast things fly by and uh, I was actually fortunate enough to go back to Queenstown a few weeks ago and I went back to my hotel where I stayed during X-Men some of the restaurants I mean it was so so fun and I was we were just like a bunch of actors that were thrown down there and we had to hang out and it was like myself and Lynn Collins and Leah Schreiber and Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds, all these guys were just down there, Don Monaghan. And uh, before I knew it, it was it was over. And I was thinking, did that really just happen? So I would do it again in a heartbeat. Hope you guys don't mind, but um, I've gained a dog in this video. He seems to want to sleep next to dad. So it looks like this is going to happen. So we just got to roll with it. Say something into the mic, Vasco. Say something. Introduce yourself. Okay, I'm gonna do some some Korean questions because my Korean fans are amazing. So, 이제 한국 question 할게요. 아 다니엘 한국 드라마에서는 언제 다니엘 얼굴 볼수 있나요? They're asking when they can see my face in a Korean drama. 아 항상 한국 드라마 하고 싶어요. 근데 좋은 시나리오 나오면 진짜 할것 같아요. I'm saying I, I, if I get a good script, I'd really love to do it. But you know, time time, criminal mind time, time is not So I don't have time because of criminal minds. But um, when criminal minds is finished down the road, and I have a little more time. Uh, I will definitely, definitely jump on a Korean drama. Um, the Korean drama shooting schedule is very difficult, so uh, it takes a lot of energy. But uh, I miss it, and uh, you'll see me sometime soon. Come on, come do you want this? Which one do you like? What one would you like? You go. You go. So, um, next question. Hey Lenny, H E Y L E N I asks, "What is your favorite experience while filming Criminal Minds, or what what has been your favorite episode so far?" Okay. So, geez, my favorite experience. There's been a lot of them. Probably this last season, there was an episode called Ex Parte. And that was uh, an episode where my wife, uh, played by the beautiful and super talented Kelly Fry, um, she was taken hostage by a supremacist group. And Simmons, my character, had to go in and uh, rescue rescue his wife. And uh, he was a little pissed off. And he got, uh, it pushed him almost over the edge. And he almost ended up choking one guy to death. And so... Whenever you get a chance to play the arc like that with your character, it's super fun. Uh, we always get to, to do great stuff in the show, but every once in a while there'll be an episode centered around your character, which is always challenging and fun. And I hadn't had an acting challenge like that for a while because I had to play the fact that my wife had been uh, taken hostage and I also had to stay cool with the team and in order for me to be allowed to, to stay uh, in the BAU and work the case with them, I had to maintain a certain level of, of calm. And so that was tricky, tricky to play. And um, I was really happy with how it turned out. And uh, yeah, check that one out. I'm not sure which episode it was, but it was season 13, it's called Ex Parte. Um, the next question is, do you have, oh, from Molly Dolly 1980. So you're born in 1980, so you're right around my age. Um, favorite motivational quote or favorite mantra? Good morning, hi, hey, you got one? What's your favorite quote? Give me food. 
It's a good one. Well, I had this framed actually. Um, by one of my favorite authors, Roald Dahl. He uh, he wrote the BFG, Matilda, James and the Giant Peach, all these amazing uh, books from when I was a kid. And so this is this is one, and it says um, it says he said above all, watch with glittering eyes the whole world around you because. The greatest secrets are always hidden in the most unlikely places. Those who don't believe in magic will never find it. I know it's cheesy, and uh, nothing wrong with cheesy once in a while. So that is, uh, that's one of my favorite quotes, and it just kind of, you know, life can get crazy sometimes with our schedules and our obligations and family and money and traveling and just pressure of life and sometimes you know you got to remember to to stop and look for amazing things you know you just there's a lot of crazy amazing things that happen that happen to you every day you can see um so you know, just stop and breathe and take notice next question is from jess.nov hi how are you and they're asking what's the most difficult scene in criminal minds what what's in that are you bored of me answering questions? Are you hungry? It's, all, it's almost it's at dinner time, that's why he's not getting this. Most difficult scene in Criminal Minds is always the, uh, the profile scene. And it's funny, no one realizes this, but all the actors dread that scene because the profile scene is, is where we all kind of line up and we have to deliver to um, the, local, the local law enforcement um, what we have sort of come up with in terms of what's going on with the, with the crime at the crime at hand um what the unsub is is thinking about you know um how would you come up with those conclusions what his or her characteristics may be or tendencies and so you've got all eight eight actors in a line and we've all got about two chunks of dialogue to say and it's usually pretty tricky because it's technical so you're saying things you wouldn't normally say and we have two cameras that are roaming like this right and they say action and uh, and it's fine, but the problem is if you're like fourth or fifth in line and you screw your lineup, you gotta start all the way back to the start again. And so for the most part, we get through it okay. But um, there's also a lot of times when uh, it's kind of like a snowball effect. So if one person screws up and the next person screws up and the next person, it can become uh, a catastrophe pretty quickly. And so those scenes can either take 40 minutes to shoot or four hours to shoot, depending on how good we're doing that day. Come here, you know what? You know what? You know what? You know what? 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 You know what? You know what? What do you do? Okay, Starry Red Love asks, would you ever adopt another dog or puppy again? Uh, absolutely, 100% I would. It's um, It's been tough without Mango, and uh, we need a little time to adjust. I mean, I know Roscoe's needed some time. He was, he was pretty depressed, and she was, they, they became very close in the six months or eight months that they were together. Um, she wasn't a big fan of other dogs, and she fell in love with Roscoe right away, so they... They got along really well because he's so cute. But um, I would definitely do it, but it's got to come naturally. That's my thing. I'm not going to go out and like, actively seek out another dog. Um, my life is so crazy that it's, it's, it is difficult to have dogs because you, for me, they're part of the family and uh, they need care and attention and love. And so I travel a lot. So, you know. I'm not going to take one on just just at the drop of a hat. I'm going to wait and see what happens. But um, if the time comes and the right pup comes, I would for sure. And I encourage all of you to to um, to adopt rather than buy from a breeder. That's very important. If you're if you're thinking that you might want a doggy, um, you know, go find a, a rescue or find one that you can adopt from a, from a shelter because there's a lot of dogs that, that need they need help and. Um, there's some dogs coming over from Korea now. Um, Roscoe came over from a, from a farm in Korea, and obviously he's fantastic, and they, they need families. And so there are programs now in Korea that uh, they're actually um, 
allowing people to fly back with dogs um, just, just as transport. Um, so if you volunteer and you're flying back from Korea, you can volunteer to have a dog come with you and then drop the dog off here and then the dog will be taken to their their families, their new families here, but they need to have a way to get here first. So it's a fantastic program and uh, things are happening in Korea, uh, really positive things. It makes me very happy. And uh, But absolutely 100% yes. Live one. Oh. I'll do another Korean one. This is from Turbo the Doggy Dog. And they say, Raskonen Honja Chajinigo is there. Golden Retriever Malgu Jindo style. Manyaga Ibiangan Otoseo. So they're asking uh, if Roscoe is doing okay by himself and by, you know, alone. And also, uh, not necessarily a Golden Retriever, but w what do I think about adopting a Jindo style? And. Uh, I mean, I just answered the other question about it. I'm wide open. Uh, I love golden retrievers, but I, I like Jindos very much. I think they're fantastic dogs. Uh, they have a very energetic soul, and the ones that I've met in Korea have been really, really cool and fun. Um, so I'd be wide open to that. There's a lot of them that need homes. Um, and yeah, Roscoe's doing okay. Like I said, he, he's had some moments where he misses his little sister, but um, he's going to be just fine. Okay, almost done with the questions. Um, last, here, here's one from... Oh, I know you. Chianti Mugliari. How are you, my dear? You've asked many questions. You've been a fantastic fan throughout the years. So thank you so much for your love. And they're asking, what do you do when you're on a long distance flight? Uh, I can just show you what I do. Ready? Maybe we can put some effects in, some plane noises, and light some the captain speaking. And I wouldn't have Roscoe with me, but this is me on a long flight. That's basically it. This is from Chandelogy 89. C H A N D O L O G Y 89. Daniel, did you play video games growing up? If so, did you have a favorite? Mine was Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Street Fighter is a fantastic choice. I was a big fan of Mario Brothers. I was a big fan of The Legend of Zelda. It's a great game. I recently just got the Nintendo Classic System, a little system with all the games. And then uh, it has like Excite Bike, Legend of Zelda, Mike Tyson's Punch Out. All those games are great. I'm also a huge fan of when Nintendo 64 came around, the, uh, was it Goldeneye? The Bond game, where it was like one of the first that I remember, probably wasn't the first, but um, multiplayer, you have four players with four separate split screens, and you could like, you could actively search out each other in the same, like the complex, you could go after each other. And we had one friend that like, just didn't really get it as good as the other ones and he'd just like end up with a rocket launcher running into a corner and like my other like Matt and I would just like team up on him and we'd just laugh and, and just blast him with like what the clobs just clob him out right and he'd just run in the corner over and over he didn't get it he didn't get it it was a good game though you let me read my questions? how am I supposed to finish this but if you're not going to let me read would you want to hold them? okay next question is from just Kazuk, Just Kazuk, they're asking, who are your favorite British actors from the UK? Uh, I have a lot of fa uh, favorite British actors because I think they're just wonderful. Uh, I'm a big Peaky Blinders fan. I like Killian Murphy a lot. I like Tom Hardy. I think he's really, really talented. I'd love to work with him one day. I mean, Ian McKellen is fantastic. Um, James McElroy. Um, who else do we have? Ewan McGregor. He's, is he from Scotland? Yeah, I love Ewan McGregor. I, I just, uh, he's one of my favorites. And uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is pretty awesome as well. There's so many, they're, they're, I think there's something I think that's rooted in the theater. You know, they come from a, th a theater background. They're so, they're so, so good. So um, yeah, I have a lot of favorite uh, English actors. Okay, Jackie4403 asks, what is your favorite go-to place back home in Michigan? Wow. Um, I have so many in Michigan. Um, 
I bought a home up north in Michigan like nine, ten years ago, and so I have a nice little house on a lake up there, and it's just it's my escape. But um, my favorite place to go to is probably Mackinac Island, and Mackinac Island is an island um, in Lake Huron off the coast of Mackinac City in St. Ignace. It's just, you take a ferry for, it's like a 15 minute ferry ride out into the lake and there's this five mile, uh, I think it's about five miles wide, the island. It's called Mackinac Island. And it's like going back in time and to like the late 1800s and they have only horse and buggies. They don't allow cars. They have like fudge shops and trinkets and these old colonial homes that are just gorgeous. There's a huge fort on top of the mountain in Poland. It's just, it's a really magical place. Um, I've been out there probably 15 times throughout the course of my life and it's just very special to me. If you're ever in the Michigan area, I definitely recommend seeing it. It's a little out of the way, but it's worth it. And um, if you've ever seen the movie Somewhere in Time, Somewhere in Time takes place on Mackinac Island. It's Christopher Reeves and Jane Seymour. It's a film, I believe, from 1979, so it's, it's too old for me. But um, it's a great, great movie, and the whole movie takes place on Mackinac Island, so uh, check it out. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for asking the questions. Um, I love you all, and uh, it's really humbling that uh, you really care what I have to think about these things. But um, we've enjoyed it, right, uh, Roscoe and I? And uh, we'll try to do these more often. Hope you like it. See you soon.